Welcome to the very first episode of Ask the Grounding Experts, where our experts from ENS Grounding Solutions answer your engineering questions about the world of grounding and earthing. Today, David Stocken answers the question, what is the sphere of influence? Okay, so that's a great question. What is the sphere of influence? And why it's so great is it's a, a question both electrical engineers and electricians deal with all the time, even sometimes when they don't know it. If you're an electrician, you've been asked commonly by the city inspector whether your ground rods have a 25 ohms resistance to ground or not. This has everything to do with the sphere of influence. Same thing with electrical engineers. Often they have requirements for very specific resistances. You know, they want to hit 5 ohms, for example. Uh, and this, again, relates back to the sphere of influence. So, what is the sphere of influence? Well, the sphere of influence is a theory that tries to describe the volume of soil that a given grounding electrode or earthing rod will utilize to dissipate its electrical energy into, right? So you can imagine one, you drive a ground rod in the ground or an earthing rod into the ground. There's a certain volume that it can actually really utilize for getting rid of electrons into, right? It can't utilize the soil on the other side of the earth, right? It can only utilize a very local area. And the closer that soil is to, to the rod, the more saturated with the electrons it's going to be. Because remember, when we're dealing with a ground rod or earth rod, one of the primary goals is to dissipate unwanted or objectionable currents, transients, harmonics, electrical noise, these electrons that we don't want, we want to get rid of them and get them into the earth, right? What is electricity, right? It's an electron that's been freed from its orbit uh, around an atom. And it wants to get back to an atom and get back into orbit, right? Where do we have a lot of atoms? The Earth. So we tie uh, an Earth rod, a ground rod, into the Earth, and we dissipate that unwanted electrical energy into the soil. And that could be fault currents, again, objectionable currents, transients, harmonics, whatever it may be. Now, that theory tells us that whatever the length of that electrode is, right, that is the area that it can is equal that radius is equal to the radius of the area that that electrode can dissipate its electrical energy into so for example an eight foot ground rod right somewhere a little little longer than about two and a half meters for those of you who are uh, in europe there uh, that's eight feet in any direction or a, uh, eight foot radius or 16 feet in a circle around the rod and then 16 feet down into depth and that comes into roughly around 2,500 ish feet 2,460 kind of feet worth cubic feet worth of soil that it's going to utilize to dissipate that electrical energy into you can almost imagine a, a silo but upside down inside of the ground and that's that area of soil if we put another eight foot rod, we don't want those, it also has a silo, we don't want those two close together, right? You can imagine if you drove two rods literally side by side, it's the same thing as having a single rod, right? And you can start marching those out further and further, and ideally you want to be two times the distance from your rod. So if you've got an eight foot rod, you want to go 16 feet away and put another eight foot rod in the ground. That way those spheres of influence aren't overlapping. That maximizes the effectiveness of your ground rod. If you put them closer, you're actually kind of wasting your money in a little ways, right? Now, in the National Electrical Code, we have a six foot rule. We have to be at least six feet away. But it also tells us, if you look in the informational note there, it's, it's ideally two times the length of that electrode away. Now, if you're in the IEC, you don't have such rules, but they, the laws of physics still apply. You should definitely want to place your earthing rods at least twice the distance away from each other. Now, interestingly, because we have a cubic function here, if we take the 8-foot rod has about 2,500 cubic feet, roughly, right, worth of soil it utilizes, if we just made that rod 2 feet longer, make it a 10-foot rod, it doubles our sphere of influence to 5,000 cubic feet, right? This is the power of the cube. 
And so these deep, that's why you see oftentimes deeper rods are recommended or long extensions. This sphere of influence applies to long buried horizontal extensions. You could imagine if you put a hundred foot long buried conductor in the ground that was down, you know, a meter or so into the earth. If it's a hundred feet, the sphere of influence of that rod is a hundred feet, or that conductor is a hundred feet, even though it's horizontal. It's also a hundred feet into the air, but a hundred feet down into the soil, right? So this is why we often, you'll see recommendations for two ground rods or earthing electrodes, where you place a 10 foot rod, for example, you bury a trench, you trench a conductor into the earth 20 feet long and put a second 10 foot rod. You get, in essence, not just the two 10 foot rods, but you get the 20 foot horizontal conductor and you really get a very large amount of soil that you're trying to dissipate that electrical energy into. And uh, just to wrap up, you can consider it uh, resistances in parallel. Think of the Earth as cubes that are one meter by one meter by one meter. And if each one re we assigned a resistor to it, we get resistances in parallel. And the more copper we can put across those resistors, the lower and lower and lower the resistance to that electrode is going to be because we're getting across more and more parallel resistances. This is the power of the sphere of influence and it ultimately drives the resistance to ground of your electrode system. This is the ultimate, uh, this is uh, uh, the sphere of influence. It's a theory that tells us um, the amount of soil a given electrode system will utilize to dissipate electrical energy into. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. If you found this episode helpful, please give us a quick like down below and subscribe to stay up to date on future educational videos we will be publishing. And feel free to post questions or comments below as well. We might even feature your questions in future videos. If you want to learn more about the amazing world of electrical engineering and grounding, be sure to check out our certified online courses at the links in the description below to kickstart your career. We'll see you next time.